morning, everybody. Our speaker for today is Angela Acosta, who is among the busiest person I know. Um, if you think you've accomplished a lot with your life and not to take anything away from anybody on this call or anybody who is a member of ILR, you have nothing on Angela. She is unbelievably busy, active, and probably one of the younger people to have just recently passed her exams for her PhD. She has an MA. Um, all she has left to do is her dissertation and her defense of her dissertation. Um, she is a student in Iberian studies in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Ohio State University. She actually grew up in Gainesville, although she is in the process of moving with her family to Texas where her uh, father just got a job with Rice University. Um, in Florida, she attended the IB program at Eastside High School before studying English and Spanish at Smith College. Her research currently focuses on early 20th century women's literature in Spain and representation of the Spanish Civil War in literature. She is going to do a two part series. And I really encourage you to, to attend both parts of her series. The first today is the Spanish Civil War and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Um, the presentation will give a historical overview of the Spanish Civil War from the perspective of the, Amer of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, um, they were a diverse group of about 2,800 American volunteers who fought fascism in Spain as part of the International Brigade. Her presentation next week will focus on Spanish culture and society during the Franco regime. And we will talk more about that next week. And with that introduction, I turn the presentation over to Angela. Buenos dias, good morning. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me just share my PowerPoint with everyone. All right, so today I'll be talking about um, the Spanish Civil War and in particular the um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade um, as an interesting case and in entry into the Spanish Civil War for those of us most familiar with the American context. So as Ellen mentioned, I am a PhD candidate in Iberian studies at the Ohio State University. My specialty is um, peninsular Spain and Spanish literature and culture, um, particularly during the 20th century. Um, I grew up in Gainesville and attended the IV program at Eastside High School um, and later attended Smith College where I studied English and Spanish. As a graduate student and researcher, I've um, visited Spain on several occasions. Um, I conducted archival research in 2016 and 2019 in Spain, where I went to um, the capital city of Madrid. Below on the bottom is a picture of the National Spanish Library where they have a beautiful library and you can conduct research there. Um, I've also been to Malaga um, as well for, for research and other cities just for visiting. Um, as a teacher at Ohio State, I um, am a graduate teaching associate and I teach introductory Spanish courses. So things like elementary Spanish too, I've taught Spanish composition where we work closely with um, students on their writing. And most recently this past semester, I taught Spanish culture under Francoism, which is an upper level undergraduate course taught in Spanish to introduce our students to um, the Spanish Civil War and dictatorship. 
And finally, my research, and I'll talk a little bit more about my dissertation next time, but I work closely with early 20th century Spanish writers, and I especially work with um, women writers and poets. So the picture on the top right is um, in honor of um, Clara Campomor and her feminist activism in Spain and work towards um, women's suffrage. So without further ado, for the presentation today, um, I'll be first starting with an introduction to the Spanish Civil War, the main actors and events. That will be followed by talking a little bit about the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who they were, um, and, and referring to a couple of people in particular. Um, and to close, I'll be talking about how the Spanish Civil War has been remembered um, until the present day. After the presentation, there'll be an opportunity um, for a question and answer session. And these materials that I'm bringing for, for this session as well as the next have been adapted from a teaching workshop I attended for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archive and course materials for the course I just taught on Spanish culture during Francoism. So let's begin with the Spanish Civil War. Perhaps you're already familiar with that Spain had a dictatorship during the 20th century and may have heard about the Spanish Civil War as well. Um, but I mostly wanted to focus on kind of the consequences of the war and what led to the war rather than particular battles and things like that, because it's a little bit different than wars that had been fought previously, not only on the peninsula, but in the world. So the war took place between 1936, July of 1936, and ended in April of 1939. So um, thinking back towards the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, what kind of led up to the Spanish Civil War? There were a lot of political factors. 19th century Spain, um, was a bit of a turbulent time in terms of, its, in terms of its government. This was also a time when Spain was fighting wars to try to re regain control over its um, colonies. And in 1898, Spain finally lost um, its remaining colonies of Puerto Rico, the Philippines and Guam to the United States. And with this loss of the colonies, Spain also kind of lost its sense of identity. The loss wasn't, too big, wasn't felt seriously on an economic scale, but it was felt in the sense of culture and the sense of um, intellectuals and artists kind of not really knowing what direction this Spain was going in terms of a nation, in terms of its national identity. So that was really the biggest effect of the loss of the colonies. Although there were economic difficulties going into the 20th century, um, which led to the end of the, the first dictatorship of Miguel Primo de Rivera, it's considered a dicta blanda or a more soft, if you could call it that dictatorship where it wasn't as oppressive or long-standing as the Franco dictatorship. Following that was a six-year republic, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But I also wanted to point out kind of leading up to the Spanish Civil War and the dictatorship, the foundation of the Falange. So Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, um, who was the son of Miguel Primo de Rivera, founded the Falange. It's a pol Spanish fascist political organization, and it's kind of Spain's own form of fascism, or the, the Spanish phalanx, as you could call it in English. The Second Republic is the main um, governing body that, that was in power as the Spanish War was beginning. And by some accounts, you might see the dates from 1931 to 1939. I have them as 1931 to 1936, where they had control over the entire Spanish population. It's divided into what's called two trienniums or three-year periods when, um, when they were um, voting in for three periods, sorry, three years. So the first triennium began with the proclamation of the Republic in 1931. As you may already be familiar, Spain has a monarchy and prior to the Republic, there was form one former Republic, for, but it only was um, around for a few days in the mid 19th century. So this was the most longstanding Republic. This meant that the King Alfonso XIII abdicated the throne and gave power to the Republic um, for the first time. So it was proclaimed in 1931, the first triennium was very successful. It was a time of optimism, cultural effervescence, um, and a lot of excitement, even though it was marked by the economic uncertainty and other in instabilities. The first triennium is known for a, its liberal Republican government and its many reforms. So on a social level, there was um, divorce was legalized for the first time in Spain. This had huge, um, huge uh, ramifications for women who wanted to get divorced. Um, it was a time in which um, Spanish society and the idea of family was changing, um, but if only temporarily. In terms of labor, there were it was moving towards um, more laws for unemployment and the work week. Agrarian reforms, which would become highly important during the Civil War, um, failed. But educational reforms um, were still very um, 
very important and, and significant. So they, it was secularization of education, a new Krausist education system that kind of replaced a more traditional church-led system and um, higher levels of literacy throughout which, and those efforts continued through the Spanish Civil War and also pushes towards regional autonomy. The second triennium starting in 1934, ending in 1936, was a much more center-right government that undid the reforms of the first triennium. There were strikes, there was a revolution in Asturias, um, and a lot of political repression and polarization. This left Spain in a not so great place in 1936 when the third election cycle came around and the left unites in the popular front. However, the army conspired and there was a July coup. And that's what started the Spanish Civil War. So overall, the Spanish Civil War, we could consider it the first war fought on purely ideological grounds. That's really kind of the main motivation behind people fighting, behind people choosing to volunteer or go to Spain. These ideologies consisted of many different factions and, and groups. These would include communism, fascism, liberalism, and anarchism. And I'll speak a little bit about what groups um, comprise each side of the war. It was also a political laboratory in a sense. This was a moment of, of revolution in the 20th century, collectivization, women's emancipation, um, rise in education of the peasant and working classes, as well as international solidarity. And as a result, the war generated immense amounts of culture and representations that continue to this day. There's been consistent research done within my field of Spanish um, cultural studies, constant debates in the media and among, among Spaniards themselves, and the production of many images, literature, memories, art, film, myths, everything. So this kind of this war has kind of left a huge lasting mark on the um, on Spanish culture, on how people perceive Spain, not just in the 20th century, but what it looks like today in the 21st century. So the war actually didn't begin in the on the peninsula itself in Spain. The war began um, in Africa, and I'll have a, a map on the next slide. So the um, the the military, the Army of Africa, um, planned in, in July of 1936. To, um, to stage a military coup. Now it was initially unsuccessful, which meant that they had attempted to um, begin a coup um, in multiple points on the peninsula and in Africa. However, um, the army eventually was successful in um, beginning a war against the popular front, the democratically elected government. Um, so Francisco Franco, who would later become dictator of Spain, he was the one leading the military against the supporters of the government. The coup itself was expected to last a few days. And once the war got going, thought that it would be over by Christmas of 1936. So the longevity of the war was very surprising, but a testament to um, how longstanding those divisions and, ch and challenges um, Spain was facing um, remained because Spain was a largely um, agrarian or rural um, nation. And there was very little um, industrialization um, and, and people were very unsatisfied with the landowning elite. And so it was a war fought over ideology and fought over land. So here's, a, here's um, two maps of Spain. The one on the left you'll see is um, of Spain in 1936. So what, 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 is, what um, belongs to Spain, I guess, is a, is a good question to start with. So um, Spain is on the Iberian Peninsula on, in Western Europe. Um, the Iberian Peninsula consists of Spain, Portugal, and Andorra as well as a few islands. So Spain, of course, has this central part here with, with its many autonomous regions. And it also has two island communities. On the right, um, on the east of Barcelona are the Balearic Islands, um, where Mallorca is. And then they also have the Canary Islands, which aren't pictured here, but off the coast, the western coast of Africa. The most relevant point, part of the map for us is in thinking about the Spanish Civil War is Spanish Morocco, which is um, the northern part of Morocco, as you can see right across from the Strait of Gibraltar. So at the time, Spain had more control over Morocco, which is why the Army of Africa was stationed there. And because um, in, in the end of the 15th century, um, Spanish Muslims and Jews were, were forced out of the peninsula, there's a longstanding cultural connection between Northern Africa and Spain um, for those who, who were forced to leave. Nowadays, Spain has much less control, but they are a European nation with land that belongs to them on the African continent. So in the, in the country of Morocco, they have two strongholds still. So the first is Ceuta, which is just on the tip 
um, across from the Strait of, on, on the Strait of Gibraltar, as well as Melilla, which is a little farther down on the coast. So if you're hearing about the migrate, migrant crisis in, in Africa and, and people trying to leave to go to Spain, you may have seen that some of those people didn't cross into actual mainland Europe, but rather were trying to get into Ceuta or Melilla um, via Morocco in order to then ask for passage into Spain, which is why um, the, the geography has kind of lent itself to different migrant paths, right? So let's talk now about the two sides of the war, the nationalists and the Republicans. Um, and there's, there's many names for them and many groups um, uh, um, within each. So the nationalists were considered the rebels. They, was, those were, the, they were the ones who started the rising in, in Africa. Um, they were fascist, although it was a bit different than it, um, Hitler's Germany or Mussolini's Italy. They were more, more or less Francoist, and we'll talk more about that um, when we talk about the dictatorship. Um, but they united under Franco as the, as the general, as the leader, um, and had a different take on, um, on authoritarian government than other similar nations. They, they weren't unified terribly well um, in, in the sense that different groups united under them, but they had their differences and it was, it was extremely true for the Republicans. So for the nationalists, they were conservative, they were traditionalists, they were Catholic, meaning that they supported the Bourbon monarchy and the restoration of the monarchy following the, the Spanish Republic. They were anti-democratic and anti-enlightenment. And on the left, you can see um, a picture of the flag under the nationalists and was used during the dictatorship. That, that symbol in particular um, is, is used, utilized a lot during the, the dictatorship. The Republican government, the last um, democratically elected president was Manuel Azaña, who um, continued in power and continued um, trying to keep the government going during, throughout the war. They were considered the loyalists because again, they were the democratically elected government. They were the ones who should have remained in power um, according to how the, the government, the um, elections are run and also considered the Reds allusion to um, communism. There were many groups under them, but they were um, more or less all progressive and liberal. They were modernizing, hoping to make the country more modern, more industrial, anti-clerical, um, democratic and revolutionary. And on the right, you see a picture of the tricolor flag of the Spanish Republic. To continue the nationalists, who, which groups were under each. So we have the Army of Africa that led the rising, the Carlists, which were those in favor of restoring the Spanish monarchy, and the Falange, or the newly formed Spanish um, fascist um, party. The Republicans then um, had many, many groups under them. Um, the Popular Front, those that was the Spanish, the Second Republic, that was who was elected last was the group known as the Popular Front. Catalonia and the Basque Country were also in support because those were industrial strongholds in Spain. Spain's only really more industrialized urban centers were in um, Barcelona as well as in um, Bilbao and the Basque Country. Um, then you have a whole list of um, parties that are, were under the Republicans or, or grouping. So we have the General Union of Workers, the Spanish Socialist Workers Party, anarcho-syndicalist -syndica unions and many others. And so these were very different factions, had their own ideologies um, and, and things like that, but um, ultimately all supported the Republicans. So when we think about the war, it's kind of a, a clash between the two Spains, both sides of the war, the Democrats, or sorry, the, 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 the nationalists and the Republicans, um, a, a democratically elected government and one that was, was starting in an uprising, they both claimed to represent the legitimate Spanish nation. They both claimed that they were the true Spain, right? Um, which is why it would be considered a civil war. Um, what's, what's interesting is when we think about naming these two sides of the war, what scholars have often done, um, particularly when talking in Spanish about the war, is rather than calling the nationalists um, nationalists, right? This idea that they represent the nation as seen in their name, um, they're instead called sublevados, and sublevados alludes to the rising. So they were the ones who invo were involved in the uh, in the rising in Africa, and the rebels who started the war. And that word in particular, those um, those rebels were the or sublevados, um, kind of more accurately explains the situation they were in, as opposed to thinking of them as nationalists as such. So both claim to represent the true Spain. Um, the nationalists portrayed the enemy as foreign as being Asian or communist or Jewish, and the Republicans 
claimed the enemy was German, Italian, fascist, imperialist, right? Um, so within the literature and within the, um, of the time, there's a lot of rhetoric around being the legitimate Spain of being the true nation. Um, and, and again, being a war fought on ideological grounds. So what were some of the domestic issues that were kind of plaguing Spain at the time the war broke out? So there were a lot of long-term Spanish tensions, tensions and problems that came um, to surface in the 1930s. Firstly, there was a lot of uneven development of industry and education. There were again, very little industrial centers, mainly in Barcelona and the Basque country. Education was severely lacking. There were efforts made by the Republicans as part of the pedagogical missions or misiones pedagogicas during the war to bring education to very rural areas of Spain. And as such, there were many agrarian problems. There were, um, Spain was a mainly rural nation, um, much more than its European um, neighbors. And um, there was a lot of, lot of tension between the landowning elite and those who were um, farmers and didn't have much um, in the peasant uh, part of the population. As I mentioned earlier, there was a national identity crisis brought about by the loss of the colonies in 1898 and the loss of Spanish empire. Um, consequently, there was a frustrated and top heavy military and increasing frustration by those um, supporting the Republicans in terms of the lack of democracy and social justice. Um, these were the liberal middle classes, urban working class and landless laborers. So as I alluded to when talking about who supported the nationalists and who supported the Republicans, there were two opposing camps and they were made of makeshift coalitions with many subgroups with very different and often conflicting ideas and ideals. And this would be very um, uh, very visible on the ground with, with those fighting in, in, in the cities, fighting in the trenches. So next let's talk about international support and intervention and kind of why the nationalists were able to eventually um, defeat the Republicans so decisively. So on the side of the nationalists, international support consisted primarily of Mussolini's Italy in the form of 50,000 troops, as well as um, arms and other um, resources and Nazi Germany, which sent 16,000 troops. Portugal um, sent also 10,000 volunteers. Um, perhaps you are aware that Portugal was also under dictatorship during much of the 20th century by Salazar and so um, it also became a, um, a fascist or, or dictator state, right? Um, and then Republicans didn't have the same sort of support by any means. They were mainly in terms of troops supported by the international brigades um, led by the Communist International, which recruited these people. Um, they came from many different countries and we'll talk a little bit about them later. So 60,000 international brigades, the Soviet Union, um, which sent um, tried to send support via um, technology, um, you know, arms, uh, supplies, things like that, but it was nothing compared to what Italy and Germany could provide. Mexico as well, and they really served as a, as a place of refuge um, following the, the war and then France. It's also important to note where you, the US stands in terms of these, this international support. FDR adopted a non-interventionist approach and declared the Congress, of uh, the American Congress declared neutrality um, so a non-interventionist approach with foreign powers. Um, and because of that, the Americans could not go under, you know, they, they didn't have, they weren't part of the official US Army, but rather as part of the international brigades. Um, in total, throughout the war, um, half a million soldiers and civilians were killed. It was a very bloody conflict and it continued to be bloody um, for the years following the war. Um, so just to reiterate regarding the military strength, um, German and Italian troops, remember this was moving, this is the 1930s, so right as, the, as World War II is emerging, the war ends. So this was a time in which both Germany and Italy were trying out new technologies and strategies, later used um, it for much success for them in World War II. Um, the Republicans, on the other hand, were severely underfunded and lacked supplies and weapons. Um, there's many um, testimonies or memories of the Spanish Civil War, of being in the trenches and just lacking food, lacking supplies, having to share arms, having to, having not, not, not having ammunition, um, the very bleak living conditions um, and very striking at the time, which is what led to international media attention um, for, for the conditions they were living under and the, and the many deaths of civilians and military alike. 
So and I have another map here which shows you the progression of the Spanish Civil War over the course of the three years. So the top left is Spain in July of 1936. Remember the uprising was meant to break out in more parts of the country and be more successful. And while it did continue, um, it had fewer strongholds than was expected. So we have the Army of Africa, which crossed the Strait of Gibraltar into Andalusia, the southernmost region of Spain. Other areas under nationalist control that remained under nationalist control was um, Galicia. It's a very, um, it was a very poor region and that was the region actually where Franco was from. Another important location was Pamplona in Navarra. Navarra is a region um, right on the French um, border here with Pamplona. Um, and then as you see the war progressing, the, the fight was on for, for control of Madrid, right? The capital city, um, the Republicans initially had control over it and I'll see pictures in a minute of that, that fight. Um, the, nas the nationalists ultimately gained control over Madrid. Um, Barcelona was also a city where fighting was breaking out in the streets and the, and the different coalitions under the Republicans were seeking to um, maintain control. Um, and as a, as a result, um, really the war ended up being mostly fought in Madrid, Barcelona and Andalusia, but of course it was throughout Spain. Here are some pictures of the siege on Madrid, which began in 1936. It was a very bloody and scary time. Those who were able to left the city um, the war is mostly fought in terms of entering the city. Um, the mountain range to the um, northwest of the city was how the nationalist troops infiltrated. And they went into the part of the city where the university is, the Complutense University of Madrid. That university center, it's, it's to the northwest of the center of Madrid, if you're familiar with, um, with what Madrid looks like, as well as the park that's, also, that's considered in English, the park, park of the West. Um, so the nationalists entered through via the, um, the university district um, and really destroy the university buildings, as you can see on the bottom left picture. Um, they built forts on um, the top right isn't my picture, but I was able to see these forts that were built that now remain in the Park of the West. And as I mentioned, um, the Republicans were, were the ones in charge of the city. So this banner says no pasaran. That was the slogan of the Republicans. They won't pass, they won't get through. And underneath it and says, um, I'm translating here, Fascism wants to conquer Madrid. Madrid will be the tomb of fascism. So really rallying around these cries to protect the city. Ultimately over 10,000 people were killed and the, and the nationalists did gain control of the, over the city where they would later have a victory parade when Franco won. So victory happened um, quite decisively. The, the problem was the international brigades left in 1938 um, and they just didn't have the resources or might um, to, to lead to his Republican victory. So the war ended on April 1st, 1939, when Franco declares victory. He wants and gets unconditional surrender and has a victory parade in Madrid. The Republican government, the Popular Front, um, goes into exile, first in Paris and later in Mexico City. Um, and it actually remained in function until 1977. It was also um, the first large refugee crisis to be widely covered by visual media. So here you can see pictures of, you know, the chaotic aftermath of the war, people trying to leave. Um, and I'll talk about this towards the end too, of, of trying to leave through France by any means necessary, um, crossing the Atlantic to, to get out of Spain as, as quickly as possible. Here's another picture. This is from a French magazine. So again, a lot of press coverage of the war in, in magazines like in France in particular and Life magazine and others in, in the United States. So people, we're seeing what this bloody war was 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 looking like, right? The the chaos, the trauma, the um, the bombing, all of that was was vis was visible on news racks across the world. It was a media war, um, and this was largely due to the efforts of Robert Capa, a war photographer, as well as his colleagues um, Herda Taro and Chim Seymour. Um, these were these were young adults who went to Spain. Um, they were um, basically in sent. They, they went on their own and later collaborated with French newspapers and they just went along with the soldiers and, and took pictures from the front. They took pictures from the trenches, pictures of ruined cities, anything they could get. Um, thousands of pictures um, came, out of the, came out of their efforts. Um, unfortunately, Herda Taro um, died during the war um, by perhaps friendly fire um, as she was on a truck. Um, but the other two um, continued working um, 
in the field following the war. So the picture on the left and is is um, also on the right is the falling soldier, right? That that person leaning back. Perhaps you've seen this photograph. Um, it was in Life magazine and, and many others. And it's it's caused a lot of controversy because people, the, the narrative behind it is that the soldier um, was shot right when he was taking the photograph, but people aren't so sure. And there's still a controversy there. But regardless, it's one of the most recognizable photos from the from the war itself. So I have some more pictures here. Um, again, they went to France. Um, they, they took some pictures over a few month period, went to France and provided them with the negatives. Um, and these, these pictures were also used as part of propaganda posters um, as well, which we'll see. If you're in, more interested in learning about these photographs and what these photographs contained, um, I highly recommend this. It's a book and a documentary on Netflix called The Mexican Suitcase. These photographs um, ended up, these negatives that were considered lost ended up in Mexico and were found again in 2007. It's a really interesting story um, and kind of brings together different, different narrative threads of the Spanish Civil War. So check it out if you're interested. I also wanted to um, highlight some literary and artistic production during the war, of which there were many, as well as following the war. Um, I'll reference homage to Catalonia in a minute. There is also Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the, Bells, For Whom the Bell Tolls and many others, um, both of, of literature and art and film. So we have here the film adaptation of For Whom the Bell Tolls. We have more recently Pan's Labyrinth, um, well-known films like Land and Freedom, The Spanish Earth, um, which give, them, give a take on the um, Republican, life for the Republicans and their, their fight there. Um, and again, these, these, all, these representation, representations all continue to the present day. Um, I'd like to share a, an excerpt from Homage to Catalonia. So George Orwell um, went to Spain actually, but he wasn't um, part of the International Brigade. So he was, he was British, but he um, fought instead for the um, Marxist um, Union group um, and went with them to the trenches in Spain. Um, and he was later injured and had to recover in a hospital. Um, and I think it's really interesting. He gives a um, he gives a lot of accounts of what it was like just being on the ground there, being in the trenches. What was the military like? This was a military organization unlike any other. So you'll see when I read this this um, excerpt here. So this is his first person account, and he says, "Everyone from general to private drew the same pay, ate the same food, wore the same clothes, and mingled on terms of complete equality." If you wanted to slap the general commanding the division on the back and ask him for a cigarette, you could do so. And no one thought it curious. In theory, at any rate, each militia was a democracy and not a hierarchy. So as he says here, um, you know, these were people with, um, with very um, egalitarian, communist, um, ide you know, um, they, their ideological, um, imperatives were very different from a rigid, the rigid military structure of the nationalists, right? They, they wanted this sense of equality. They also didn't have a lot of military experience among them, right? Um, for many of them, they were young, some even teenagers fighting for the first time, um, which as a result led to many casualties. Um, so again, Orwell wrote Homage to Catalonia, one of the greatest um, representations of the war in, in English. Um, and, and many others have been translated into English as well. So um, as I've mentioned, um, the Spanish Civil War really was a battle over narrative, a battle over ideology, a battle over who is the real Spain, who is the true Spain, um, and, and continues to this day. Um, and many issues remain unresolved, whether that's about the photography or about um, particular um, events that took place during the war. Um, and there's still no generally accepted moral interpretive framework. So it, for, for those of us who are working in um, the study of Spanish literature and culture, there's still a lot of debate about in particular the memory of the war um, and much work being done currently on um, these representations of the war and studying um, the literature and studying the art and things like that. So again, there's, there's more pictures. This is now um, the New York Times from 1936. This is dated to July 19th and July 20th. So this is right after the um, rising broke out. Um, it says Spain checks army rising as Morocco forces rebel two cities in Africa bombed. Rebels gain Southern Spain, civil war rages in cities, two Madrid cabinets fall. So it's kind of this domino effect of a lot happening 
all at once, where they were able to crush some revolts, as it says, Seville revolt crushed. Um, but ultimately, it led to a huge outbreak throughout the country, including the Canary Islands. So this was this was really everywhere. Um, um, very chaotic time, especially at the beginning of the war. Um, propaganda also became very important during the war when we teach the Spanish Civil War and um, we like to use these as examples to show students to think about the slogans behind them, the, the imagery used and things like that. These um, posters kind of depict the struggle of good versus evil, right, or democracy versus fascism. Um, on the left we have it says Arriba España or Onward Spain, which was used during the dictatorship as their, their slogan, they're raising their, their right arm. Um, and kind of this, this sense of power from the from the um, nationalists. In the middle, it says discipline, um, the only command is, is the slogan of victory. And you see the um, Republican tricolor flag, you see soldiers fighting. Um, there were some women involved and I can talk about this later, um, but it was mostly um, men in the trenches fighting. And um, the one that most interests me is, is the one on the right um, because it, it's doing a lot in terms of using this photo montage effect. So it says, ¿Qué haces tú para evitar esto? What are you doing to avoid this? And then on the bottom there in red, it says, help Madrid. So these were real photographs, but it became a photo montage of putting these photographs in wildly different contexts, right? So you see the woman and the child, um, which was probably taken somewhere other than the, the background image. So the background image of the ruined building, there were many ruined buildings because of the bombings. Um, so all of these images and the planes too, right? They're real images, but put together as part of a photo montage to create this effect, to kind of draw on your heartstrings of really wanting to help these people, these civilians who are suffering um, in cities, right? The cities like Barcelona and Madrid were bombed extensively and never fully recovered right after the war. And it was very brutal. Um, alongside propaganda was um, was other um, product was other literary and cultural production. The nationalists, in particular, had a very strong um, intellectual ba base of of um, academics, and they actually had things like their um, like like um, magazines of sorts among academics of nationalists. And the um, Republicans had the Alliance of Anti-Fascist Intellectuals, uh, which was um, an international movement. And they were created, those in Spain created El Mono Azul, which is a, a weekly newspaper. Mono Azul refers to the overalls that those fighting were wearing. And this would actually get out to the soldiers on the front. It was a cultural magazine. They say it's in defense. It was a weekly magazine of the anti-fascist intellectuals in defense of culture. Um, and so the, the most active um, poets and writers of the time, people like Rafael Alberti, Maria Teresa Leon, were publishing um, articles, um, poetry, um, things like that to support the Republicans, to support those out on the front um, reading these in the trenches. Next, I'd like to talk about the Abraham Link Lincoln Brigade. As I mentioned, this was kind of, this is kind of how we introduce students to this topic um, because a lot of people just don't know who the Lincolns were. Um, and the reason being is because FDR declared neutrality um, for the United States. So this was not something the US military sent, but rather a group of volunteers later banded under the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. So they were part of what's now what's known as the International Brigades. So the International Brigade sent around 35,000 and 40,000 um, volunteers really from all over the world. Some of the places that sent the most were France, Germany, North America, and there were also many Jewish volunteers all of whom were rallying around the cry of protecting um, the, Spanish, the Spanish people from the threat of, threat of fascism, from um, all the destruction they were facing, um, just simply being civilians in Spain at the time. And we had around 3,000 volunteers from the United States. These people consisted of um, workers, of students, of intellectuals, um, men, women, um, and people of different races, white, Latino, African-American, people came from Asia, people came from all over. Um, to fight in Spain for the Republicans. Um, and it says on this, at this poster where you see men of, of different races, it says all of the, the um, countries or all of the groups in the world are in the international brigades on the side of the Spanish people. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Spanish Civil War in the US before introducing the Abraham's, um, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Brigade. 
So at the time in the United States, you know, they're receiving these um, newspapers and magazines that are depicting the violence of the war. Um, they're seeing these reports coming in. Um, it is, it's very worrying, right? It's, it's violence against civilians. It's not just against um, the military. Um, and it mobilizes people to want to do something. Um, Roosevelt at the time was hesitant um, and Congress adopted neutrality laws. This meant there was no arms trade, no travel to Spain. That no travel meant that those who wanted to fight actually had to take a boat to France and cross through the Pyrenees Mountains, which was a very difficult trek just to get into the nation, into the country um, through the Pyrenees. Um, people who most favored the Republic were, were involved with the labor groups, um, the liberal left, liberal pro Protestants, student movements, and they called an end to the embargo. Um, businesses in the Catholic Church would favor the nationalists, because remember the nationalists were supported by the Catholic Church and the clergy. Um, and on that note, many clergymen actually were murdered um, during the first days of the war. In particular, they were a very targeted group for that reason. So knowing that context, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade stepped in as being the, the American volunteers fighting in the war. However, few of them actually had military training. Um, as a result, many were wounded and died. They also didn't have adequate supplies to begin with. Um, the odds were definitely stacked against them. Um, they're, they're known for being the first fully integrated US military unit, um, something that hadn't been experienced before and wouldn't be experienced for a little while after. Um, again, it, as, as we saw in Orwell's account, it was trying to be very egalitarian, um, no hierarchy. Um, they're also known for being what's called premature anti-fascist because they were fighting against fascism before the United States entered World War II. And there was kind of this gray area here for these people with, with communist leanings who are going to Spain at a time when the United States just wasn't, um, would, had decided for neutrality. Now they would sing a different tune when they, during the dictatorship, when American presidents um, like Eisenhower would actually support and side with Franco, but that wouldn't be for a few more decades. So here's a picture of a um, integrated unit from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And they were actually called the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. There were four battalions as part of the American volunteers, but afterwards they all called themselves the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. As I mentioned, there were in fact women who, who volunteered in Spain, um, about 60 nurses and ambulance drivers, um, people like Solaria Key, who was a nurse there. Um, these were women who kind of had to force their way in and, and say, hey, I can, I can help, I can drive, I can take care of people and just kind of jumped in as needed. Um, and there's really, there's still really great um, videos and testimonies available from these volunteers, um, both male and female. Um, and I have a couple of things I wanted to share with relation to who these volunteers were. So um, here's, a, here's a newspaper article. I was just kind of looking online for, for what um, was being reported about these volunteers. Um, and I found this, this fascinating. This is about Delmer Berg and he died in 2016 as, one, as the last American volunteer um, who was alive. And although he's unique, you know, for, for having lived to 100 and, and having fought in the war, his story of how he got there isn't too different from what his, his comrades were experiencing. So that's what I wanted to share today. So um, the, the article reads, Mr. Berg, an unreconstructed communist, was a 21-year-old union card carrying hotel dishwasher in 1937 when he spotted a billboard for the brigade and through the Young Communist League enlisted. After cobbling together bus fare to New York, he boarded the French luxury liner at Champlain for France. I was a worker, Mr. Berg told the Modesto Bee, a California newspaper in, in November. I was a farmer. I was in support of the Spanish working people and I wanted to go to Spain to help them. So again, um, really his, his story of getting there isn't too different, right? He was really called for his you know, political beliefs for the ideology of seeing what's happening um, and being inspired to do something. A lot of the um, testimony by these people is really the strong sense of, of, of needing to do something, of watching what's happening and feeling like they could um, make the change by going to Spain. And as I mentioned, they had to go to France first because the United States wasn't allowing safe passage to Spain. Um, and it was a tough journey because they'd get to France, they'd have to cross through the Pyrenees Mountains, which are um, high altitude, um, also, the winters in Spain were pretty brutal during the war, um, and so they would they would get their cross into the, into Spain and and join um, the international brigades. 
I'd next like to share a letter um, that was sent by Knut Frankson. He was a Jamaican born mechanic and he traveled to Spain from Detroit in April of 1937. So this is an excerpt from um, a letter he sent to a friend back home. He wrote it from Albacete, Spain in, 19, in July of 1937. Um, and, and here's what he says. Um, and remember, he's a, he's a black man. He's a um, working class mechanic who, who decides to, to fight. And he says, on the battlefields of Spain, we fight for the preservation of democracy. Here, we're laying the foundation for world peace and for the liberation of my people and of the human race. Here, where we're engaged in one of the most bitter struggles of human history, there is no color line, no discrimination, no race hatred. There's only one hate and that hate is fascism. We know who our enemies are. So a lot of really interesting things here. The first is again, his call to duty, call to fight in the war. Um, he also alludes to the fact that he's treated well. He's not um, treated poorly for his race, um, something that, that black people were of course experienced in America was a very different story when they got to Spain and they felt for the first time respect that they weren't, um, you know, belittled by their by those in those in their units and in the military units or things like that. He's he's saying he's he's fighting for black liberation. He's fighting for the liberation of of, of the entire human race here. This sense that what's taking place in Spain has ramifications for the entire world. And if you're interested in learning more about the individual stories of these, those who fought um, or just more about the um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade, there's a um, group called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive. They're a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to promoting social activism and the defense of humans right, human rights. Um, Alba's work is inspired by the Abra American volunteers of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade who fought fascism in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Um, so while these met these um, these volunteers were still alive, um, and especially in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of work involved in, in recording oral histories and things like that. And now that they've all passed away, there's um, a lot of work being done on social movements of today and human rights issues facing today, as well as um, a huge um, archive of materials about who these people were and educational resources. So I actually participated in a workshop led by Alba last summer um, for learning how to teach the Spanish Civil War to students. It's, it's a challenging thing because students and, and many of the general public simply aren't aware that the war even happened. Um, so finding activities and ways of engagement and connection is really important, which is why we use the Abraham Brigade because I remember when I was learning about the Civil War in college, the first time I learned about it, I had no idea and had never even heard of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. All right, so I have a few depictions of the Spanish Civil War in, um, in uh, art in particular. So I'll begin with Guernica. Um, perhaps you, you're familiar with Picasso's painting. So Guernica um, is a town located in the Basque country in the northeast of Spain. It's a, it's a um, region of Spain um, that had more in, in industry, as you'll recall. Um, and basically the Germans bombed Guernica in April of 1937 on market day, which meant everyone was in the streets, huge civilian casualties. Um, the German Air Force was using this as an opportunity to test um, techniques that you later used um, during World War II as they bombed London and other cities, right? So again, a precursor to what would what would come, um, a very bloody day, a very surprising attack too, right? These are again, all civilians. They were out and about on market day and it just, the bomb just hit them. So very terrible. And of course there was huge media coverage, um, Franco bombers wrecked town, brittle fleeing mobs, um, Franco atrocity shocks the whole world, so hundreds of civilian deaths, again, very terrible. So Pablo Picasso, who wasn't in Spain at the time, but was reading these reports, wanted to, he wanted to do something. He, like, like many others, he was horrified. And he came up with creating, creating Guernica. Um, it's a very large painting. It took many steps for him to get to the final product in terms of how he kind of reorganized the imagery here. Um, and it's, it gets a very large painting. So it's three and a half meters by 7.8 meters. It takes up most of the wall of a very large room in the um, Reina Sofia Art Museum in Madrid. So as you see, um, it's, it's, it's heavy on imagery and symbolism in depicting what happened in Guernica. So he depicts the bomb in a way that you might not recognize. So um, especially if you're not too familiar with Spanish. 
So the bomb isn't, you know, it doesn't look like a regular bomb. It's actually represented by the light bulb at the top. You see the light bulb here um, blazing with light. So the word for it would be bombilla in Spanish. So, so bringing together bomba, bombilla, that word play there is how he represents the bomb with the light um, rather than an actual bomb being a, appearing in the scene. Um, we see a, a, a um, building in flames on the right with the, the woman screaming. A lot of um, other imagery um, that you can take a look at. Um, we see a bull, a symbol, a symbol of Spain. We see a lot of um, fragmented bodies, a horse um, with kind of swallowing the bomb in its mouth. Um, a woman crying, just this terrible scene, um, kind of all pulling together in this color scheme that's that's using black and white, right? So again, it's a very large um, uh, image for, for those who have visited the painting in the Reina Sofia Museum. Other depictions include what we now have um, a collection of which are children's drawings of the war. Of course, children were around and deeply impacted by the war and later dictatorship um, and were a source of Spain's re-education efforts. So it's really, I, I find Im impactful to look at their, their drawings. Um, they draw quite well. Um, we see the Nazis bombing towns in this one. In the next one, we see um, people seeking refuge. So there's, a, um, there's people crossing what's a border. It says on one side, Spain, the other side, France. Um, and we see a little Spanish flag on the top right. So kind of thinking about what were these children going through as they had to leave the country? What were they experiencing? What was what what fear was there? What what um, emotions were there as they left with their families or without their families in some cases? Um, the next one is drawn quite well. Um, they're at a train station. They've had they've left their bags um, behind because there's a plane coming with a bomb. They're headed towards the sign that says refugio or shelter. Right, get to the shelter get to the safe space. Um, so just kind of trying to see how children process this terrible um, moment in their lives. The last part is how the Spanish Civil War has been remembered. How, what, um, what have we done to re recall its legacy, recall the memory, recall the, the victims who died? Um, one of the main points of contention are the um, mass grave sites of, throughout Spain. Um, in particular, there's a lot in um, around Madrid and around Andalusia in Southern Spain. For those who are perhaps familiar with the history of Federico Garcia Lorca, he was assassinated in Granada. Um, which is in southern Spain. And these murders unfortunately continued far after the war ended during the chaotic first years of the dictatorship that I'll speak about next time. So there's these mass grave sites throughout Spain and there's a huge push right now to identify the bodies, identify the, the victims. Um, those, those were found in the sites, some of them were nationalists, some of them Republicans, just kind of all together. Um, and what's really sparked interest has been what's called in the in, in my field is in particular, we refer to the grandchild's gaze. So of the people who died or, or even survived the Spanish Civil War, their grandchildren were, were born in democracy, right? They two generations later, it's around, I would say, the millennial generation. So especially impactful for people in their 30s and 40s who are learning about these stories, but didn't really hear them firsthand from their um relatives because the parents wouldn't really talk about it or talk about the dictatorship. So there's this huge curiosity for those coming of age around the millennium to really do something and, and realize that some of them had lost grandparents or great grandparents or other relatives who were buried in these mass graves. Um, a great um, film for, for kind of talking about this issue and talking about how it remains um, impactful today is called El Silencio de Otros, The Silence of Others. In this film, you'll hear um, testimonies by people who um, lost loved ones. This woman um, lost a parent during the first days of the war. Um, and the, the gravesite was actually located underneath a highway underpass. And so her and, and many others were fighting in the last years of their lives to do something and to identify their loved ones and to make change and find justice for those who were victims of um, both being murdered during the war as well as um, torture during the dictatorship. Um, another site that's, a, that's seen as the site of victory, there's, there's a victory arch in Madrid and there's this large um, structure called the Valley of the Fallen, El Valle de los Caídos in San Lorenzo de la Escorial. So 
it's a little it's a it's a bus ride north of Madrid. It's a little um a little to the north, but very close by. Um, and it's um it was constructed by laborers, by um people who, who are prisoners basically, um, to create this this large monument. There's a cross at top. Here's a better picture of the cross. So you see there's a cross at top, there's a large mausoleum within the mountain here. It's still a site of 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 curiosity and pilgrimage today. Um, it's a site of protest. So um, on the top left, you see people supporting the fascist government. These are photos taken not too long ago, only a few years ago. Um, you see a black, uh, sorry, a white and red um, flag, which is this, the flag of the Spanish monarchy. You see a, a, the, the Francoist flag and you see the Franco salute. On the bottom, uh, you see a, a, a poster that says criminals, criminales, right? Uh, people support the Republic, you see the tricolor flag. So people go to this site and, and, and make demonstrations, pro-Franco and pro-democracy demonstrations um, consistently. Um, it's, it's a very gruesome site. I've actually never been myself um, since I, did, I had an opportunity to go to the Escorial but didn't wanna go to see this site by myself at the time. Um, it's a site where more than 33,800 people were buried. Um, it's a, again, a mausoleum. So what that means was there were tombs set aside for Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, the founder of the Falange, as well as Franco, who was buried there in 1975. Um, so, so they're in the center part, right below the big cross in the mountain. There's also an abbey there, which is very interesting um, point to note. So besides that, people who um, were buried there um, were, were considered the um, those who fell in, in support of who the fallen in support of the nationalists, right? They they were um, killed by the Republicans. But what also happened was unfortunately those who were constructing this large um, monument died as well. Those those prisoners. Um, again, it remains a point of contention, mostly because most recently Franco's remains were moved to a family cemetery in Madrid in 2019. Um, another monument, this time in, in support of the victims of the war and the, the Republicans, there's very few monuments in support of them. There's still monuments in support of Franco to this day. And this one was also seen on the cover art for the, the movie, the, the Silence of Others. This is Memory Viewpoint, um, constructed in 2009, a monument to victims of the war in, in Extremadura, so the, the westernmost um, region of Spain. Um, finally, I'd like to mention these routes of exile um, were very um, chaotic and um, means of, of escaping the country. So even during the war, um, children of Republicans were sent to England. Um, there were boats sent to England, as well as the Soviet, children, Soviet Union. Um, these children would later kind of try to find who their parents were, try to find their, their, their ancestry to go back to Spain. Um, but that was kind of a way of keeping these kids safe um, because the Republicans uh, who, were who were later in prison during the war, um, the women in particular had their children taken away and given to nationalist parents. So um, it, was a, it was a huge pull, a huge push to, to keep the children safe um, and out of the hands of, the, of Franco's regime. Um, besides that, families and, and adults alike um, went to a few places. So many, many um, went to France, up to 180,000 um, people. And then, and I'll show that on the next slide. And then others went to Mexico and Latin, other places in Latin America. The United States was not accepting refugees and particularly through the laws it passed in the 1920s. Um, they also went to the Soviet Union. So you see here a lot of paths through New York, through Mexico, through a few places in the Caribbean and in um, South America, especially in Argentina. Um, very few of these, these um, people who went into exile would return to Spain. Um, following Franco's death in 1975. And there is a, what's called an internal exile of those who remained in Spain during the war. Um, finally, we have um, pictures of the Spaniards who crossed the Pyrenees into, into France. People tried to escape the easiest way possible through France, although it was still treacherous. Um, there, were, there were routes of migration in Spain that I can talk about later. Um, and they suffered in concentration camps. They were kind of corralled onto the beaches of France lived under extremely harsh conditions. Um, many would actually end up um, both the soldiers of the former uh, Civil War soldiers on the Republican side and civilians would end up in concentration camps during World War II. So again, a very difficult, um, chaotic time.
not with a lot of um, good happy endings. So in, in moving forward in time and thinking about the dictatorship that followed the war, I'll be giving a talk next week on July 15th about Spanish culture during the Franco dictatorship. Well, I'll give an overview of the dictatorship and um, reference a few cultural artifacts from that time period if you're interested in learning more. So at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, I can share my, stop sharing so I can see everybody um, and we can go from there. So any questions and you feel free to send me an email as well later if you, if you have more questions. Okay, any questions for Angela? Just a comment. Can you go hear ahead, me? Paul. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, a dear friend of mine, his wife, uh, she grew up in Spain. Um, her father was in the Spanish Civil War. I invited her to this. She said it's too painful even now to yeah. discuss. Um, and she wrote a book. I'm trying to locate. We moved to the book somewhere else. But uh, she wrote a book about her father in the Spanish Civil War. And I had no idea it, it profoundly impacted the people of that nation for so many years to come. Um, and it's a very interesting talk. Thank you for enlightening me. Yeah, thank you for being here. That's very true. This is a very painful moment. I remember when I was in Spain, I was talking to um, a, a young man who was a little bit older than me, but whose grandparents had had suffered during the war. And he talked about that too, of like, it, they don't, they don't even want to see the Valley of the Fallen. They don't want to see these, these reminders because you couldn't talk about it during the war. So this long period of amnesia, and I'll talk next time about the laws that were passed in Spain that were trying to help through the democracy, but ended up actually protecting those who were um, torturing the, the Spanish population. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, one moment, Angela, we have a question here from the Oak Room. We'll go back and forth. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. And um, if, just let me know if you don't mind, if you can hear it clearly, if we need to have it repeated. Hi, Angela, okay. I'm Don Collier. Uh, I have a language, two language questions. Okay. Uh, first, uh, your pronunciation of Guernica, uh, where does that come from? Yeah, so Guernica is in the Basque country. In the Basque country, the main language spoken there is Euskara, and Euskara has a different language origin than anything else on the peninsula or anything else in Europe. It's not a Romance language. It's very different from Spanish or any other language, and linguists are kind of working out the origins of it. So Guernica was named through the Basque language of Euskera rather than through Spanish or Castilian Spanish. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, uh, what is a mono azul? Mono azul um, is, a, is the overalls that the, the blue coveralls that people who fought in the war were wearing. It's, it's not and that was monkey. also the name of the newspaper. Mm -hmm. It's not a blue monkey then. <laughs> no, it's not, yeah. But they use, the, they use the image of the monkey in there as well, actually, yeah. All right, thank you. Richard Petway, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I, first I have a comment and then I have a question. The comment is there is a relatively new book called Spain in My Heart, which uh, uh, basically talks about all the Americans uh, uh, in Spain that were part of the, some a part of the Lincoln Brigade and some administrators uh, and what struck me was a lot of uh, people that were had been in the Soviet Union Americans had been in the Soviet Union and had become the basis of the administration um, of uh, uh, the Republican side and additionally uh, a really interesting uh, part of the book was um, when the Lincoln Brigade uh, left Spain, they had a uh, parade mm -hmm. for all the Americans in Barcelona. And it was an outstanding uh, uh, kind of uh, last hurrah of, uh, before all the Lincoln Brigade uh, toward the end of the war uh, left uh, Barcelona for Spain, uh, for France, and then departed elsewhere. Uh, my, my question really um, is concerning um, what ended the war, because uh, uh, it, my reading of history says that uh, uh, Franco never 
totally conquered Madrid. Uh, it conquered uh, certainly uh, Otamana, the university mm -hmm. area, uh, but um, uh, I, I don't know exactly if that is true. And the other thing was, I thought that what ended the war was um, Franco's drive to the sea, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, when he drove a separation between two uh, Republican sites, namely Barcelona and Valencia. So uh, he split the, the country uh, between the two and they could no longer um, ship goods between these two industrial sites that were in Republican senior. One other comment, remember that this was the party uh, that was in power. So they had lots of money at the beginning that they used to buy arms from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was the only one that would sell uh, arms in any quantity uh, to Spain or to the Republicans. But the Republicans started out with the treasury um, of Spain at that time and basically used all that to buy armaments. Uh, to, but of course, the treasury ran dry. And so I'd like to offer those as questions and a really uh, excellent performance. And um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, um, for, for your enlightenment. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not familiar with the book, so I'll check it out. Um, I'm not as familiar with, I guess, the military history of the war, the particular battles, but it's my understanding that the war ended mostly because the Republicans just didn't have the strength to win. There was, you know, the Harama was a was a battle that was kind of caused a lot of casualties on both sides. Um, and as the war went on and then the, the, the international brigades left, they just didn't have the might anymore to hold them off. Um, also in Barcelona, you know, they, Oh, where's this one? In Barcelona, they there was a chaotic beginning of the war where everyone was out in the streets and full of energy, and and eventually the tide shifted. Um, is is kind of what happened that they just kind of were overwhelmed, and during the beginning of the dictatorship and those first months of trying to consolidate control, Franco basically um, was was leading huge mass executions, huge um, imprisonments of of anyone who supported the Republicans. That's how he's really able to claim decisive control over the population during the years of World War II and later kind of lessening that tight grip on the country um, starting in the 1950s. All right, Angela, we have a question here from our Oak Room again. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Kramer. Well, <clears throat> last night I watched the video on Netflix, which I recommend- Speak into the microphone. Everybody in this room. It's on Netflix, it's a 2019 film. What I did learn was that Franco uh, served as a dictator for 40 years and the, his party of criminals had taken children, thousands of them away from mothers and sent them to uh, the Franco uh, participants to be their children. And the parents never knew where the children were. They were gone. The people who were killed, the bodies were never returned. And therefore, this film takes place in 2019 to commemorate these people. One of the things I was horrified at, in, during Franco's reign at the end, they passed a law called the law of forgetting. Nobody was allowed to bring any suits against anybody. You were never to mention the war. It was not taught in any of the schools. Nobody knew anything about it. It was buried. These people in 20, uh, 2020 were trying to get some credit back to the people who had suffered so. But watch that film, it is riveting. What is the name? And the name of the film is The Silent of Others. It's on Netflix and uh, it's uh, absolutely, today watch it. It's something else. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing. It, it is a very powerful film. I, I remember we watched it with a group of classmates just kind of crying. It, it was, it's very impactful, especially with, with hearing of the children that were taken away. And the main reason behind that was because they didn't want them to grow up with the same ideals of their parents. They didn't want them to learn about, you know, the communism or learn about these ideologies of the Republicans. And that's why they were trying to take them away. So that would cut that connection with the generation. And the amnesty law, or the law of forgetting, actually was passed in the 1970s as part of the new democratic government, but it ended up um, basically helping um, those, those the Franco's torturers, essentially, those, those who were, you know, committing crimes under the dictatorship. Yeah. Okay, if you have time, Angela, we have one more mm -hmm. question here from our Oak Room. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to thank you for a very fair and impartial uh, depiction of the Spanish Civil War. My father fought in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the Republic. And uh, a lot of the things that you've shown, uh, I have seen and talked to my father about. My father was in a French concentration camp uh, in Mardi Gras. Um, my father had a daughter and a wife who he lost in the Spanish Civil War. That daughter was taken away from his mother from her mother and given to a fascist family. So uh, again, thank you for a fair depiction of this Spanish Civil War. I don't consider it a civil war. I, I consider it a coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. uh, there were more Germans and Italians fighting uh, for, for Franco than there were Spaniards. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for sharing that. It, it is a very, you know, it, it affects a lot of people and, and, you know, the younger generations aren't as, are a bit removed from it now, but it, it um, it's still very much parts of family history and things that haven't been talked about here in the U.S. or in Spain. The gentleman in the Oak Room who just spoke, have you ever thought about trying to find your father's daughter who was taken by the Nationalists using ancestry? We're getting him the mic, one moment. Uh, yes, I have. Um, I hired a, um, someone in Spain a few years ago. Uh, he found my father's um, wife and, and daughter uh, in uh, records throughout Spain through, um, uh, but what happened was after a few years, he lost track of them and they sort of disappeared. So the idea was that they were, either the wife was murdered or taken away uh, to uh, to prison, and the daughter was given to uh, some uh, fascist family. Okay, uh, I myself belong to a lot of Spanish organizations at, through the war uh, about the war. I also had met uh, in my early when I was younger a lot of men who had fought in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. I'm originally from New York, and a lot of those men were from New York City. And uh, fortunately for me, I've met many of them. My father belonged to a lot of. Spanish organizations in New York City uh, that were Republican after the war. And there was a great uh, large Spanish uh, refugee community in Brooklyn Heights uh, after, the, after the war. That's where my father met my mother, who was also Spanish. Well, thank you. All right, Richard, you have another question? Yes, sir. Uh, I want to talk about the, the Valley of the Fallen a little more because uh, the original idea that Franco came up with is that all Spaniards, Republican or Falange, would be buried together. So, you know, that, that uh, was uh, his theme, theme song of why he wanted to uh, be buried himself along with the Falange uh, leader. But, um, Right now, they're busily doing DNA studies of all the bones that are remaining there to try to identify uh, the fallen uh, to alleviate the problem of what happened to my brother, what happened to my son, and so forth. Uh, it's a mammoth study that um, the Spanish government has undertaken to really try to solve that particular problem of what happened. You know, so many people were killed and buried in various places, uh, but they are now, uh, as I understand it, a national enterprise to try to identify the DNA by DNA 
all the people that were buried in the Valley of the Fallen. And can you give me an update? I do know you updated that uh, Franco has been removed uh, from mm -hmm. his special crypt um, in the Valley of the Fallen. But if uh, you could comment anything about the DNA study, uh, that would be interesting. Yeah, so yeah, so Franco was removed in 2019 and he was placed in a, a, his family grave. Well, one point of cont uh, contention um, that I didn't mention was the fact that his daughter had and his, um, his uh, descendants had inherited land titles of nobility um, that they, they kept for some time. Um, but anyway, so with the DNA studies, um, what's going on now, what studies had been done kind of starting at around 2000 or so, were kind of privately funded, um, mostly kind of by people who were impacted by the descendants. And now they're trying currently in the legislation to pass a new memory law, a law of democratic memory, in which public funding would go towards um, exhumations and DNA um, identification. Um, that would last a few years, but that hasn't, they're, they're working on that right now. It hasn't passed yet. They're, they're still debating. Thank you. So we have one final question from the Oak Room and then we'll let Ellen do her final comments. Go ahead, sir. I just want to make uh, two comments. One is I had a friend who, who was a, her father was a, uh, an official in the Italian Air Force. And she says most of the bombing that was, go was going on like this were, were actually Italians go, um, leaving from, from either Italy or from Sardinia um, and, and so on. But the but that almost all of the, the testing that was done either by the German Air Force and the Italian Air Force was done in the Spanish Civil War. The other thing I wanted to point out is, is that um, in the maps that you were using like this, I noticed that there was no connection with Brazil. There were a lot of immigrants like this going through Brazil to, to uh, Portugal. Um, and that, that was another very common connection that was made by expatriates or, or other you know, people going to participate in the Spanish Civil War. Right, yeah, the, the maps kind of had the main routes of exile. There's actually been some um, digital humanities work being done that shows kind of those actual paths and kind of the, the many different paths that they took. So it probably includes more nations like Brazil on those, yeah. And, and also maps of the, this Portuguese dictatorship. Okay, Ellen. Angela, thank you so much. Um, uh, very good presentation, very informative. It's obvious that some people here know a lot about the Spanish Civil War and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And some of us here had no knowledge of it. And you certainly have informed us um, and given us literature to read if we're interested in following or getting more in depth um, information about the Spanish Civil War. And we look forward to your presentation next week. Very good, thank you so much. Thank you, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you, Angela, everyone stay well. We'll see you next week. All right.